My real voice makes me sound like a woman, so I use this manly one instead. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's great to be here. I'm Jane Lynch, and welcome to Hollywood Game Night. <laughs> you laugh, but I actually had somebody say to me, has anybody ever told you that you look like the actress Jane Lynch? I said, no, just you. Everybody else has been polite enough to just think it. <laughs> but for some reason, you seem to think that telling a middle-aged man that he looks like a middle-aged woman is an icebreaker. <laughs> Why don't you really get on my good side and tell me which Teletubby I sound like? <laughs> and don't you dare say Tinky Winky. <laughs> To clarify, my name is Jeff, and for those of you sitting in the back of the room, I'm a man. <laughs> Hashtag, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> my doctor told me I have low testosterone. I said, how low? He said, you can start shopping at Ann Taylor. <laughs> One night, a woman my age approached me after a show and said, you got something against being a woman? <laughs> I said, no, ma'am. In fact, I'd like to go through menopause just to see if it'll make my voice as deep as yours. <laughs> Here's a question I get a lot. Hey, Jeff, that's not your real voice, is it? Oh, no, of course not. My real voice makes me sound like a woman, so I use this manly one instead. <laughs> yeah, if I were using my real voice, you'd be thinking, hey, look, Ellen really let herself go. <laughs> one time, somebody actually asked me if I were a woman who had surgery to become a man. I said, no, but if I were, I'd ask for my money back. <laughs> what woman wants to pay to become a man who's less manly than the woman she used to be? <laughs> the upside is whenever I need to go to the bathroom really bad, I can use any restroom I want. <laughs> And another cool thing about my voice, if I ever go into politics, this voice will protect me from political scandals. <laughs> I did not have romantic relations with that woman. <laughs> oh, don't worry, we believe you. <laughs> now, although I'm not a manly man, I'm not a girly man either. I'm right in the middle. I'm what you might call a manly girly man. <laughs> Whenever one of my manly man friends says, hey, Jeff, you want to go to Cabela's and check out the shotguns and crossbows? I'm like, you know it, bro. As long as we can stop at the Yankee Candle store on the way home. <laughs> Whenever one of my manly man friends says, hey, Jeff, do you like the Miami Dolphins? I'm like, you know it, bro, for two reasons. One, Larry Zonka and Dan Marino are two of the baddest hombres to ever play the game. And two, I've always enjoyed the combination of orange and aquamarine. <laughs> Sometimes manly man thoughts and girly man thoughts play tug of war in my head. <laughs> this guy's a jerk, I should knock his block off. But what if I break my hand? <laughs> I can't scrapbook wearing a cast. <laughs> from Cleveland, Ohio, and somebody asked me how I feel about LeBron James leaving Cleveland for $145 million. I said, it's Cleveland. I'd leave for $145. <laughs> and 
and that's why I'm working in Provo this weekend. I started my career in comedy at the old Cleveland Comedy Club in 1986 with Drew Carey and Steve Harvey. Yeah, I don't know what happened to those two losers, but I'm in Utah, son! People ask me if I still stay in touch with those guys. Well, although Drew Carey and I will exchange the occasional email, it's hard relating to people that successful. So, Drew, what you been up to? Oh, uh, you know, still hosting The Price is Right. What about you, Jeff? Oh, you know, still watching The Price is Right. <laughs> Every morning at 11 a.m., because I've got that kind of discipline. <laughs> very many famous manly men named Jeff. There are a few. Um, there's Jeff Bridges from the movies and Jeffrey the Giraffe from Toys R Us. <laughs> Turns out that martial arts expert slash movie star Jeff Speakman and I have a lot in common. His name is Jeff and my name is Jeff. His birthday is November 8th and my birthday is November 8th. He's a ninth degree black belt, and my name is Jeff. <laughs> Have you ever run a Google search for your name and discovered that there are dozens, if not hundreds of people with your same first and last name leading more successful, fulfilling, and rewarding <laughs> lives than you? If you run a search for my name, Jeff Shaw, I'm listed behind a real estate mogul named Jeff Shaw and a former Major League Baseball player named Jeff Shaw. But if you narrow the search to Jeff Shaw with the hair of Rod Stewart, the voice of Kristen Stewart, and the raw sex appeal of Martha Stewart, up pops my <laughs> photograph. to be a baseball player named Jeff Shaw and he pitched for my home team, the Cleveland Indians in the 90s. And one time I was playing a comedy club and I checked into the Motel 6 and the clerk said, hey, are you the Jeff Shaw who pitches for the Indians? I said, yeah, that's me. How else could I afford to stay here? <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'll throw you a no-hitter on Saturday if you leave the light on for me. <laughs> Another time I was playing a comedy club in uh, Alabama, a guy approaches me between shows in the lobby and says, Hey, Jeff, we've got a Jeff Shaw on morning radio here. Is he your brother? <laughs> I said, yes, our parents named us both Jeff so as not to confuse deep thinkers such as yourself. <laughs> Come back tomorrow night, you can meet our sister Jeff. <laughs> She's the manly looking Jeff in the family. <laughs> Great thing about my voice and demeanor is I can be sarcastic and people know joking. That is such a benefit when you're a comedian. I was in Starbucks recently and the barista said, can I have your name for the cup? I said, Jeff. And she said, is that Jeff with one F or Jeff with two Fs? I said, two Fs. Good catch. <laughs> I'd hate to see what would happen if you only wrote down one F. <laughs> Skinny decaf latte for Jeff? Skinny decaf latte for Jeff? Oh, excuse me, miss. Are you saying Jeff? <laughs> or are you saying Jeff? <laughs> because I'm Jeff with two F's and it sounds like you're saying Jeff with one F and I'd hate for there to be more than one Jeff with a disparate amount of F's in his Jeff both who ordered the same skinny decaf latte <laughs> she said there is something wrong with you I said is that you with one U or two U's <laughs> Recently, I 
at the Starbucks and the kid said, can I have your name for the cup? I said, yes, my name is Golden Globe award-winning actress, Glenn Close. <laughs> I figured he knew I was kidding until five minutes later I heard, skinny decaf latte for Golden Globe award-winning actress, Glenn Close. I said, dude, I was joking. He goes, oh great, now you tell me. That was a really long name you made me write. <laughs> I said, dude, I'm a comedian. My name is Jeff. He said, is that Jeff with one F or two F? <laughs> My proudest offstage moment in stand-up comedy is the time I made an African-American barista laugh so hard, steam milk shot out her nose. <laughs> She said, welcome to Starbucks, sir. Are you familiar with all of our different espresso drinks? I said, yes. A latte is espresso with steamed milk and a little bit of foam. A cappuccino is an espresso with steamed milk and a lot of foam. A flat white is espresso with steamed milk and foam layered into the coffee instead of on top. And a dumb white is a Starbucks employee who calls the cops on an African-American customer, although he's just chilling out waiting for his friends. <laughs> that joke got me a free biscotti. <laughs> with three T's. <laughs> cultural diversity. One of my favorite cities on the planet is Miami, Florida. And I was heartbroken when I recommended Miami to a manly man friend of mine back in Ohio. And he said, I hated Miami, dude. Nobody spoke English to me down there. If all those Cubans and Puerto Ricans don't want to learn English, they should just go back to Mexico where they came from. <laughs> I said, you should go back to school where you dropped out of. <laughs> Folks, I've been playing and enjoying Miami for over two decades now, and I found a way to get Latino Miamians to speak to me in rapid fire, perfectly accented English. And that's by speaking to them in horribly accented, painfully slow Spanish. <laughs> Excuse me, sir, but could you please tell me where I find the nearest CVS drugstore around here? Oh, lo siento, senor. No hablo inglés. No puedo ayudarle, senor. Oh, no problema, senor. Podría decirme dónde se ubica la droguería CVS la más cerca de... Oh, for crying out loud. You go on two stoplights and take a left at the post office and cross the deck. Ay, ay, ay. I'm a 53-year-old man, and the cool thing about being a 53-year-old man is it makes me feel good when nobody believes me. <laughs> no way, dude, get out of here. I never would have guessed you're a man. <laughs> Thank you for your cruel and hurtful laughter. <laughs> the age where young people have started telling me that I look great for my age. You look great for your age. Gee, thanks. You couldn't have just left it at you. look great. <laughs> when a young person tells you that you look great for your age, what they're really trying to say is, uh, I want to give you a compliment, but I don't want you to get any ideas because you're old and that would be gross. <laughs> I admire millennials because they are so focused, so filled with inspiration and motivation, hopes and dreams for the future. The older I get, the less ambitious I become. When I turned 30, I was like, I want to be rich. But then I turned 40 and I was like, I want to be comfortable. <laughs> then I turned 50 and I was like, I want to be in bed by 9.30. <laughs> I often find myself working alongside millennials, and uh, millennials use a phrase that I can't stand. No worries. No worries, dude. We'll take care of it. No worries. <laughs> of course you have no worries. You're 22. <laughs> I'm 53. I have lots of worries. At 22, you can eat one slice of cheese and know you're going to go to the bathroom sometime over the next three months. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha!
but one slice of Velveeta at 53, and I'm backed up like I-15 at rush hour. <laughs> you know how I can tell I'm getting older? I was at a bar slash restaurant recently, and I saw a table of college kids order a round of Jello shots, and my first thought was, mmm, I love a bowl of Jello. <laughs> The older I get, the bigger my sweet tooth becomes. I can eat an entire bag of Hershey miniatures in one sitting. You have not experienced shame until you've woken from a sugar coma naked, covered in 300 tiny candy wrappers. <laughs> and everyone at the airport has their phones out streaming you to Instagram. Thing is, I can't eat chocolate anymore because four years ago, my doctor diagnosed me with acid reflux disease and he gave me a long, depressing list of food and beverages I have to avoid. Sorry, Jeffrey, but no Coke, no Pepsi, no beer, no wine, no orange juice, no grapefruit, no pizza, no lasagna, no burritos, no gumbo, no chicken wings, no cheeseburgers, no chocolate, no mint, no chewing gum. Doc, if I can't eat that stuff, I should just end it all today. Okay, if you want, but no arsenic, no cyanide, no strychnine, no rat poison. I have a girlfriend. My apologies to everybody who just lost a bet. Wow, that joke got a bigger laugh than I was hoping for. Recently, a 33-year-old woman asked me out. She didn't know I had a girlfriend. And even if I weren't in a relationship, I wouldn't have gone out with her because 20 years is way too big of an age difference. Because at 33, she's in her romantic prime, and at 53, I'm in my Amazon prime. <laughs> my girlfriend is afraid I'm gonna leave her for a younger, prettier woman. That would never happen. I love her too much. I might leave her for a quieter, less critical woman. <laughs> If I go home with a woman half my age, it's to steal her hair care products. <laughs> I've got no game. I'm at the age where uh, romance is less important to me than silence. At 53, I, no offense ladies, but at 53, I like my women the way I like my coffee, with a lid on it. <laughs> Now, for those of you ladies who feel compelled to punch me and kick me after the show, you don't want to be known as a woman who beat the heck out of Alan after a comedy show. <laughs> Scariest thing about being in my 50s is my parents are in their 70s, which means if I make it to my 70s and my parents make it to their 90s, I could conceivably wind up in the same assisted living facility as my parents. <laughs> I'd be the only loser in the history of losers to still live at home in a home. <laughs> My dad would be like, for the love of God, you're pushing 80. When are you gonna get a place of your own? <laughs> well, according to your nurse, any day now. <laughs> I got my looks from my parents. My mom is Ukrainian and my dad is Barry Manilow. <laughs> when I tell people that I'm not a parent myself, the next question is invariably, what, don't you like kids? I love kids. But what does liking kids have to do with wanting to be a parent? I like McDonald's french fries, doesn't mean I wanna be a McDonald's employee. <laughs> I like riding in Toyota Corollas. Doesn't mean I want to be an Uber driver. I like taking risque selfies. Doesn't mean I want to be a politician. I think 
people who say they don't like kids haven't spent enough time around kids. I think people who say they want kids haven't spent enough time around kids. <laughs> Tell you one thing, kids can be expensive. They say that the average cost of raising an infant to 18 is $233,000. So the next time your kid says, I wish I had never been born, say, oh yeah, what a coincidence. I wish I bought a Lamborghini instead. <laughs> And although I'm not a parent, I am a fan of good parenting. The other day, a little boy ran into me at the mall and said, I'm sorry, sir, my mommy told me not to run indoors, but I'm having so much fun, I'm not paying attention to the rules. But now that I've caused an accident, I think I'm gonna learn a valuable lesson from this experience. <laughs> Adorable, right? So then I see his mother come around the corner and I go, excuse me, ma'am, but is this little gentleman yours? And she goes, yeah, what's it to you? <laughs> I go, nothing, just be sure to tell his stepmom she's doing a great job. <laughs> If I ever do have children, I want a dumb kid. Intelligent children are too hard to discipline and keep in line. You have a dumb kid, you can get away with lazy parenting. My parents coasted for 18 years. <laughs> dumb kids are easier to discipline. Mom, why can't I have any ice cream? Because I said so, that's why. Good answer, I got nothing. <laughs> that doesn't work with intelligent children. Excuse me, mother, but why may I not have any ice cream, please? Because I said so, that's why. Oh, really, mother, that's the best you have? 30 years on this planet, you decided to bring a new life into the world, and the best you can do when stressed out is to emotionally aggress and act like a child yourself? To assert your authority willy-nilly just because you're the all-powerful parent and I'm the powerless child without the wherewithal to procure his own ice cream? Instead of using this as a teachable moment that you can use to teach me some good adult decision-making skills so that I can make good decisions when I'm your age someday, skills such as the lay of gratification, bartering, and negotiating, well, guess what, mother? I think I'm gonna have some ice cream. I'm gonna have it now. Why? Because I said so. Touch me and I'll call the cops. <laughs> I have two younger sisters, which really upset my dad because he was hoping at least one of his kids would grow up to be a man. <laughs> When my dad finally entered the information age, he told me that I had to be the one to teach him how to use his first computer because he taught me how to ride a bicycle 45 years ago and I owed him. <laughs> that was fair. So I sat him down to the keyboard and went, come on, you big sissy, you can do it. What are you waiting for, you cry baby? Cyber wussy, go put on your big girl undies, come back down, I'll teach you how to log on to www.beamanlygirlymanalready.org. <laughs> and although I don't seek the approval of manly men, I'll take a compliment from a manly man whenever it's offered. I was doing a comedy club in Little Rock, Arkansas recently, and a very nice gentleman approached me after a show and said, hey, Jeff, I don't think you sound like a woman. I think you sound like a NASCAR driver. <laughs> I said, cool, which one? He said, Danica Patrick. <laughs> It was so cool that this guy for, uh, compared me to a member of a very manly man profession that for the rest of the week, whenever somebody said, hey, Jeff, how's it going? I go, well, we was looking pretty good in the straightaway. We was catching some good air, fixing to get our lap back, a little slick going into turn four, so she got a little sideways on me. I realized I was low on the track, so I checked up. That's when Kevin Harvick bumped me from behind in the bush flannel car. You know, Kevin would work me hard to haul race, and Kevin would spin his own grandmother out to get a lap back, and that's what happened. Got to the wall where I traded paint with Denny Hamlin, and that was all she wrote, and that's a shame, too, because we was bit real good today, Jim. That's okay. We got to get to him. We got to get a crew. We got to get sponsor. We'll just come back next Sunday and do it again. That's racing for you. <laughs> Even if you 
you don't like NASCAR, you have to appreciate the fact that NASCAR drivers are the ultimate manly men. These guys almost perish in a fiery car crash. Their car is ruined for the rest of the season. They are cool, calm, and collected. Well, just wasn't my race today. Wasn't the competitor I wanted, babe. We'll go back to the drawing board, dust ourselves off, pick up the paces. We'll get a team of surgeons to sew my arms and legs back on. We'll be in it to win it next time. <laughs> We Americans appreciate any man who can exhibit that high level of grace under pressure. I guarantee you that if a NASCAR driver had explained the financial crisis in 2008, we never would have panicked as a nation. <laughs> hey, Ricky, would you like to explain the subprime mortgage loan crisis on Wall Street to the average American? Well, what happened was we had a bunch of shady bankers engaging in fraudulent lending practices, loaning money to folks with doubtful credit history and unverifiable income records. And the U.S. banks which extended the loans and said to keep them on the books. They sold them off as high-quality bonds of offshore interest, ensnaring the global economy into what is essentially a U.S. banking problem. That's okay. We got a good team. We got a good crew. We got a good uh, sponsor. We got some Cracker Jack financial advisors. We'll just come back next fiscal year and royally mess up the economy again. <laughs> Thank you very much, Josh.